The last session that we had here was about robotics, and it was fascinating, and I'm not entirely sure I agree what was being said, but um, it was an interesting session. This one is about the stuff that I think, for me, is really, really important. It's about how can we use the power of gaming to change the world for the better. So there's four um, presentations, all sort of 10, 15 minutes long. Um, we're going to start off with Max, who's from DeepMind. I asked him to tell me something about him that was personal earlier, so I could introduce him. He wasn't playing with me, but um, onto the stage, Max, big hand, please. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some fundamental research that we've just brought out about um, touching on how humans and AIs can collaborate. And you know, if you don't know about DeepMind, this is a company that was founded here in London and then was acquired by Google and is now part of the Alphabet Group. And it's a research company. And I joined around 2014 when it was acquired. And um, at the core of what we want to do is actually try and solve intelligence and you know, create this artificial general intelligence and then use it to do a whole bunch of stuff. And obviously, these two things aren't linear. You don't do one, then two. Along the route, practically, of you know, developing intelligence, you can get lots of tools to then go out and solve problems. Um, but actually, you know, weirdly, what we're often best known for is some of our results in learning to play games and, in particular, video games. So over the years, we've sort of increased in complexity of the games that we've tackled, starting with you know, the Atari suite in 2014. These are games like Breakout and Pong and Space Invaders, and having a single algorithm that can solve all of these. And then, obviously, um, mastering the game of Go and also chess. And more recently, in January, I was part of a team which was um, creating an agent which actually beat a professional at a really complex game called StarCraft II. And you know, why are we using games given that we have this grandiose mission of like, solving intelligence? Well, actually, games are really complex and rich simulated worlds um, that are sort of perfect vehicles for us to do research in, particularly reinforcement learning. And um, they're actually very complex and you know, provide a lot of challenges that can be transferred to real world problems. And at the end of the day, all these games are actually made by game developers, not by us, um, to be sort of challenging and interesting for, you know, for human players. So yeah, the idea is we can use games to then develop general machine learning tools and algorithms to then go out in the real world and start attacking problems and making faster breakthroughs. Um, and we don't choose a game arbitrarily. Every game that we sort of study is looking at a different type of complexity. And so we introduce a new game to ask new scientific and engineering questions, and then we try and go out and answer these questions and develop solutions towards these. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about a new piece of work, which is on a new game. And amongst other things, one of the main sources of complexity is this idea of collaboration. And so this is an algorithm um, that learns to play the game of Quake 3 Arena, Capture the Flag. So Quake 3 Arena is uh, one of these canonical first-person 3D multiplayer video games. Um, it was hugely popular. It had a professional gaming scene, and it really inspired sort of a whole generation of games after that. And even you know, many modern video games actually inherit a lot of the game mechanics that were formed for this game. And this is what we call a, a multi-agent game, where you know, unlike uh, chess or Go or StarCraft, where it's just one versus one, we actually have teams of players, so more than one player per team, which means agents have to learn not only to um, compete with people they don't know, but also cooperate with people they don't know. And so in the course of this paper, we, you know, we developed an algorithm which performs really, really well in this domain, and we even have results showing that humans and agents can actually play together. So this is really fresh. Um, we published this two weeks ago in Science Magazine. And two weeks ago, my newsfeed looked a bit like this, um, which was amazing you know, for me. And we had journalists all over the world writing about this, how our agent was beating players in Quake 3 Arena. And picking out a quote is from this guy, Michael Lippmann, who's a very famous professor from Brown University. And he says, you know, getting AI agents to work together is incredibly tough. And you know, this is really true. Like, what I want to emphasize is multi-agent learning is actually really hard. It's really hard for people. You know, you know, many problems and matters of philosophy and politics and ethics are all 
coming around because of the multi-agent problem of having many people with mixed incentives, with mixed specializations, trying to interact with each other. Um, and at, you know, one of the, the root causes of this is that nothing stays still in a multi-agent learning system. You know, if, you're, if you're in a multi-agent learning system, um, it's not as if the other agents are, and the other people are fixed or frozen. They're actually changing, adapting, based on their own private experience that you don't have access to. So you can't see what they're thinking or how they're changing. Um, and this is really the crux of some of the difficulty in multi-agent learning. And so because of this, one of the key challenges is how to handle unseen opponents and how to handle unseen teammates in this game. Because as I said, as other players are changing, you might encounter someone who behaves in a way that you never have seen before. Okay, so onto the actual game. Um, this is our version of Quake 3 Arena. We've reskinned this for research, but it's the core game. On the left, you can see what agents see. It's just this first person view. Um, and agents have to run across this map and pick up flags and then bring them back to their home base. And they score if they you know, touch the opponent's flag on their home flag. But crucially, their flag has to be at their base. You know, if an agent's flag isn't at its base, it can't score. So you have to go out and tag the opponent flag carrier and retrieve your flag back home. So you have this push-pull sort of dynamic, zero-sum game. Um, and at the end of five minutes, the team which has the most flag captures is the winner of this game. So the agents must learn from raw pixels. This is just like a human. It gets no privileged information. It must in learn to interpret the screen of the game. It has to learn from the outcome of five minutes of gameplay. But at the end of five minutes, you know, thousands of button presses, you just get a single uh, signal whether your team wins the game or whether it loses the game. And then the agents have to generalize to never seen before maps, never seen before un opponents, and crucially, never seen before teammates. Um, so to do this, we train agents on a massive scale where we don't just train one agent, we train a whole population of agents which are playing thousands of games of capture the flag in parallel, all on different maps, experience many different situations all at the same time. And here's a little sketch of our uh, algorithm, training algorithm, where we have many agents playing at the same time, generating experience, and each agent's personal experience is fed back to only itself. So agents only learn from its own experience, just like we do, with a form of reinforcement learning. And then we have a population of agents which undergo what we call an evolutionary algorithm doing artificial natural selection. And there's a few key components that make these agents really um, powerful here. Um, the first is ad hoc training where, and randomization, where um, every game of Capture the Flag, we don't use the same agents. We randomly choose agents from the population to play against each other. And this means that they can't over-specialize to particular teammates and to particular opponents. Um, an interesting example is at the beginning of this project, we actually weren't doing this. And we were always training agents with the same teammates. So they always played with the same teammate. And we got what I call the, uh, the lazy agent phenomenon, where one agent of the team will suddenly learn to start capturing the flag and actually start winning games because it's capturing flags and scoring points. Whereas the other agent can basically just sit in the corner and look up at the sky and twiddle its thumbs. And it thinks it's doing great, right? Because its team is winning. It's getting that positive reinforcement. Um, as soon as you randomly sample the teammates, they can't rely on their other team teammate being competent. And this lazy agent phenomenon, thankfully, goes, uh, goes away. And then, as I, as I mentioned, we don't just train a single agent. We train a whole population of agents. And these, this population of agents all have different, slightly different characteristics and play styles. And this creates a diversity in terms of opponents, but in terms of teammates. So again, it means that you can't over-specialize to a particular play style, and you have to be able to play with, with behavior that you might not have seen before in training. And finally, we have reinforcement learning underpinning it all, which updates the agent, which allows it to learn how to interpret the screen and how to choose actions. Um, and this is based on something that we call internal rewards, where the agent actually rewards itself and learns what actions, are, what events in the game are good, things like tagging, picking up the flag. And uh, for those interested in sort of the neural network architectures in these agents, we actually have um, these uh, you know, convolutional networks, which interpret the screen, and then recurrent neural networks, which integrate experience through time. And interestingly here, we have a fast and slow internal representation 
you know, think, thinking fast and slow, where the fast part of the agent is there to observe and to react, whereas the slow part of the agent is there to remember and predict. And so here's, here's some videos of the agents playing. We train them up and they actually get really, really good. Um, this is in some of the indoor environments. Uh, these are all randomly generated and the agents play really well. They're sort of running around, tagging, uh, going completely nuts. Um, and we wanted to try and measure the performance of these agents, not just relative to themselves, but relative to people. You can, hear also, you can see here also um, some of the outdoor randomly generated environments, these weird desert mountainy things with massive cacti for some reason. Um, but yes, we ran human trials where we got a bunch of people, a bunch of video game players, um, playing tournaments with humans and agents in random matchups. So they didn't know who they were playing with. Um, and um, yeah, we played random matchups, didn't know who they were playing with. Sometimes they had human teammates, sometimes agent teammates, all the sort of mix ups. And agents won 74% of the time. So they really smashed it. And um, I think human, human teams basically never beat agent, agent teams. Um, you can see some of the frustration of like colleagues in early, <laughs> early test matches before we ran this trial. But after about 200,000 games, these agents surpassed human performance. And because they didn't know who they were playing with, we could ask questions like, who was your teammate? Um, and 68% of the humans were correct in guessing who their teammate was. And then we can ask questions like, how collaborative was your teammate from one to five? And agents were actually voted more collaborative than humans, because humans confuse collaborative agents often with uh, human, uh, human teammates, which is really interesting. Um, we even you know, added reaction time delay to agents to make sure that they were in line with human sensory motor reaction times. We found that you know, it wasn't tagging that agents were outperforming humans on, it was actually flag capturing strategy. And so interesting behavior must be going on in these agents. And we actually modeled this, quantified this, compared this to humans. We get really uh, interesting results out. Things like really annoying human behavior, like opponent base camping, where you just hang around in the opponent base, or quite nice cooperative behavior like teammate following. And uh, this is sort of a sketch of the training through time, the population getting stronger, and this blue curve at the bottom is the amount of the teammate following behavior that you see during training. And you can see as training progresses, the agents discover, oh, it's good to follow your teammates. But then somewhere around 200,000 games in, uh, this behavior peaks and actually agents start to adapt and change and you know, get rid of this behavior in favor of other things, which make them stronger. Um, and obviously something interesting must be going on in the agents and we look inside the agents, we find actually there's really interesting correlations with the game states. We're like really lucky neuroscientists here where we can peek into the agents uh, like neuroscientists can't do and we find that the agents actually have individual neurons that represent game states like a neuron which fires if your teammate is holding the opponent flag. Um, and this is all emergent, we didn't tell the agent to do this. Okay, so winding this up, um, the idea here is that we're not just solving capture the flag, we're making these general algorithmic pieces. And this allows us to scale exactly the same pieces, scale the same algorithm to games we didn't even design for. So this is the full game of Quake 3 Arena. These are professionally played maps, different game modes that the agents have never even, um, that we didn't design for. And the same algorithm can scale to that. In addition, we, the same, the same algorithmic pieces we use as the foundation um, for this StarCraft uh, Alpha Star agent, which as I said in January, beat a professional at StarCraft. So what I hope I managed to convey is that you know, human and agent collaboration is actually really hard, but it is possible. Um, and it's possible if we start thinking about something called multi-agent training. This is a hard problem, but it's a very interesting problem to study and it's very powerful. And it's powerful for, aid, for AI, and for AI development, as it's an incredibly uh, fruitful um, paradigm to look into. And it's really powerful for humans, as this is on the path for having agents which can cooperate with humans and cooperate with other agents in the real world. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I've got like a million questions I'd like to ask him, but I think the way that this works is all of the speakers are gonna be around after. So, is that right? So you'll be happy to talk to him afterwards. Um, so next up is Anand Rao, who is the global 
AI lead at PwC, and who apparently started programming AI 35 years ago. I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so not wanting to reveal my age here. Yeah, I've been, I've been working on AI and multi-agent systems since the 1985. So first 15 years or so was very much around research problems along with SRI International, mainly focused around defense and aerospace. And over the past 10 years, it's been very much around the commercial applications of those things and all the stuff that uh, Max was talking about, essentially applying it in business environments. So I'm going to be talking more about gamification in the business world, and I'm going to take very specific examples that we have done for clients. These are commercial clients, they are paying clients. So it is here, right? So it need not be in a research setting, it's actually being used by clients, like I think many of you. Uh, I'm going to pick up three things, promotions, uh, trade promotions, for example, experience, as in customer experience, how do you simulate that, how do you model that? And then finally, how do you model strategy, right? So strategic choices, which markets do I enter, how, ma how many dollars do I need to put in, what is the return, how do you gamify that kind of decision is what we are looking at. Um, so with that, again, I don't have to go through all of these examples, which everyone is familiar, Google DeepMind, as Max was saying, and initially it was the AlphaGo that beat the, the world champion, and AlphaGo Zero, uh, which essentially had no human input, right? So it was based just on the rules, and then this was just beating Go, and they actually used the same one to beat chess as well, right? So the same underlying algorithm, Alpha Zero AI, right? So we do all of those things. Now, the question is, what is the so what here, right? So yes, those games are very useful in helping us think through how do we frame some of these and come up with very technical solutions. Now, what we want to do is to take some of those and say, hey, how do we apply it in a business domain? How do we gamify some of the things that we just talked about? Now, yes, it's not the same, it's not a direct translation, a very quick view uh, as to how complex the business world gets. Again, I don't have to explain it to you. The rules of the game in Go, in other places, it is well defined. Whereas in business, the one who changes the rules of the game is the one who wins, right? So we all know that. So it's very different in knowing the rules of the game. Uh, multiple players, right? So again, in the gaming world, you could have multiple known players, whereas again, in the real world, you have people coming in from the left side and the disruptors who essentially take away your market, right? Again, what is it that you want to look for? Outcome of the game, uh, reasonably clear in many of the sort of the games, whereas in the business world, it's not clear whether maximizing profit is the right metric. So we now talk about various other things in terms of customer experience, social good, and so on. So what really is the outcome? And uncertainty in the game is far more in the real world, right? So you're coming up with various kinds of techniques. Uh, very quick notion around connection between simulation, which is what we'll be talking about, agent-based simulation, and intelligence. So the AI world, uh, for the most part, dismisses simulation as saying, yeah, that's just simulation, right? It's not real. In fact, if you just look at this TED talk by Dan Gilbert, uh, the prefrontal cortex of humans uh, is the one that distinguishes from all of the rest of the species. And what does that do? It essentially creates a model of our world inside our head both in time and space. So it creates a model, and then it can project forward in time, and then play out those decisions and make those decisions today. So a simulation, to me, is a very integral part of intelligence, as opposed to, uh, this is just a simulation, which is where some of the AI pundit would say. Again, similar things around uh, how many feedback loops you have in terms of how the system reasons, uh, gives us its intelligence, and Mikio Kaku probably says it's sort of more around consciousness, but at least if you stay on what makes it intelligent, it's how it reasons. So that's what we are trying to build. Now, again, how are we gamifying things? So first, one, first and foremost, we are essentially creating a multi-agent system. So very similar to what Max was talking about, instead of being a, a game like StarCraft, it is a game where we are taking a business context. There are two companies and they are attracting customers. Each one is trying to give a promotion of their product to attract more customers to maybe increase their revenues, right? So that's the kind of game that they are playing. And so we set up that as a multi-agent system. So we 
we have typically run up to a million agents or so and essentially create a number of hundreds and thousands of scenarios. Again, we still need more compute power to be really realistic in terms of hundreds of millions of people, but we are at least getting to the stage of a couple of million uh, uh, agents that we can simulate. Uh, then we gamify it, as I said, so that it is uh, uh, something that you can play and there is an end result, there's a time bound and so on. And the way the system learns is through reinforcement learning. Again, Max went through some of those. So those are the three things that you'll see consistently. I'm going to go through uh, uh, four examples, hopefully. The first one is called the promotion gamification. Uh, we'll look at this in more detail. Uh, two, uh, 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 two stores, one store is managed by a person, the other store is managed by an AI. How do they give promotions and how do they learn? How does the AI agent learn when to give promotions and how much promotions to give is what we'll see, right? So that's gamification, so you can start looking at your promotion strategy, which is one of the big things in marketing and marketing analytics. Uh, the more uh, tougher one is strategy gamification. So if you're trying to invest in a new market, in a new product, how do you go about doing it? Again, we'll go into an example of car share, ride share, and saying a new auto manufacturer wants to enter into to a new business, uh, i.e. Uh, ride share, and how would they go and decide that, what investment is needed, what return is needed. Uh, another one, experience, as we just said, experience uh, simulation is what people do very well. How can we get the systems to do it? So customer experience, what, what levels can you change, and can you see that effect in terms of the revenues, and the market share, and so on. Uh, and finally, the operations gamification, which is essentially looking at autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicles deciding where and when to place themselves, so very similar to some of the, the thing that Max was talking about, can we get those robo-taxis learn these strategies? Again, some very interesting results that letting all those robo-taxis play against each other with a very variable customer demand, and then you start seeing how do they learn some of these strategies so that when we have the autonomous vehicles, we can start programming them this way. Uh, so this is the, the setup here. So basically two, uh, two stores, uh, when to promote, to whom should we give the promotions, and how to promote the products to maximize revenue. So what you'll see in the next screen is something like this, where you have your own store, and this is the, uh, your store is the AI store, actually it'll, it'll come here on the right, and then on the left you'll have the, uh, the, 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 the human playing, right? So the, it's a human versus the AI, and uh, the game is there are 10 days, uh, uh, 10 or 15 days in this particular case, and you have X number of uh, uh, choices. You can invest 1K in promotion in a day, or 2K, 3K, 4K, whatever would be the amount, but you have a total number of promotion dollars that you're allowed. Now the idea is, how will you distribute that promotion? Do you do all on one day? Do you do it one, one, one uh, K per day? All of those different strategies. And obviously you're trying to observe what the other agent is doing and then make an appropriate choice. Again, we want the systems to learn this behavior and that's what we have done here, right? And then you can compare the outputs. So uh, uh, I think we can start, uh, start playing it. So this is the AI store. Let me see. Can we play the Can we play the video? You'll start seeing these there's a total budget of 5k and you can start investing 0, 1k or 2k in various lots. Can we play the video please? Can we play it? So you can see the numbers changing, right? So again, it's all happening automatically. Uh, the, the human uh, invests 1K, 2K, and so on. Uh, based on the promotions, they'll make a certain return. And the AI is also doing the same thing. You can see the game matrix there. What is it that you are doing? If both of you, it's a prisoner's dilemma type of uh, issue here. If both of you promote, you, you basically divide up the, 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 the spoils. If only you promote and the other one doesn't promote, you are taking in more of that, right? So you obviously need to play as to whether you cooperate or, or collaborate, co cooperate or, or compete is what you're doing. And there you can see the various results that come out. And again, we run this multiple 
multiple times, literally hundreds and thousands of times, of the AI agent against a number of different strategies. Right? Again, this is another one that is just playing. And you can see the values come up, your daily profit, and uh, so on. With each iteration of the game, you're saying, what is the money that you make? What is the money that the, the, the human player is making? Right? So you can see the, see the charts here. So given the time, I'm going to just move on. Uh, so people have a huge, huge variation oh, okay, of uh, various options. So you can see things which are very straightforward to uh, re uh, reinforcement learning type of algorithms, right? So that's what we have tried to do here. And uh, uh, there's a number of strategies in between as well. And we can start comparing results like this. So we have the AI agent uh, come up with various kinds of algorithms that people use, and we are trying to see how effective is a tit-for-tat strategy, how effective is a jostling strategy, right? So all of those things you can see. And again, the system is playing, and one of the, one of the key things is a reinforcement learning algorithm, which doesn't know what the other uh, algorithm is. It's trying to be, if you like, uh, res resilient to all other strategies that the other humans might be playing, right? So that's what we are trying to do here, and trying to measure the performance. Uh, so I'll close with the, the next example here. It's around car share, ride share. This was done, again, that, that looked more like a game, but this was very much a business decision that the client was making, and they want to introduce mobility as a service, right? So what we did, these were the things that we modeled, right? So it was the agent-based model, and we had a number of policies around the type of business model they were choosing, B2B, B2C, and so on, pricing, marketing spend. There was, those were all the variables. Environmental assumptions were the consumer adoption. So some people might go and, uh, into a ride share vehicle, and some others wouldn't, based on the type of trip you have, the randomness. We create a lot of synthetic data, and there's a, a, a reinforcement learning built in to look at the different strategies. So what we do is it literally have for every car in the system, this is for New York City, we'll have literally hundreds and thousands of vehicles being modeled as agents and consumers being modeled as agents. And the consumers are making the decision, is it a commute, is it a errand, is it a weekend trip, what type of car do I need, what is the probability that I'll go into a car sharing, and uh, we essentially go into these kinds of services. The result of this, is literally we ran 200,000 go-to scenarios, found out sort of 6,000 scenarios that were uh, optimal in some sense for different markets, for different kinds of combinations, and that's what they use to make their decision. In a typical business environment where you look at half a dozen different alternative scenarios, now we are looking literally at 200,000 gaming scenarios, and it's essentially a Q&A system for strategy, if you like. So specifically built for rideshare, but it takes around eight months to actually build the system, a half a dozen people, but then now now we are making multi-billion dollar decisions based on this tool. Now you go and implement your strategy and then you can see and correct it. So they haven't got to that stage, but that's the sort of the self-learning uh, systems that's happening. Again, I'm going to skip the experience uh, uh, gamification, so very similar uh, here. And uh, so we have a process for gamifying strategy. Um, again, design, build, simulate, evaluate, learn, uh, and that is a big process, right? So now we are getting away from a very traditional strategic uh, discussion to how do you actually create a gaming for this particular situation. Again, you don't do it for every uh, strategic decision, but you do it for some of the major decisions that you have. In this particular case, they were essentially changing their business from just being a manufacturer to essentially being a car share, ride share company, and they're betting almost 20% of their revenue coming from this particular type of mode over the next 10 years. So it's a big, big change, big strategic change. That's when you use, because it's sort of more heavy duty, at least for now, until we get more tools that uh, people are doing. So what is the, where is the future for this? We believe that agent-based simulation and reinforcement learning to learn some of those strategies that people can use, and in some cases, people can't think through the 200,000 scenarios, but the systems can. We can define what is the optimization criteria Criteria, what is the robustness criteria, but then let the system work through all of those and present it to us, right? So that's the way we are seeing happen. And I think what we need as a community is an open source uh, 
uh, notion of strategic games like the promotion game, like the ride share game, so everyone can start working on those types of algorithms like DeepMind and uh, other players also working in that. So that creates the community just as we have Ad ImageNet and some of the other games. And then it needs to be a living strategy, right? So the strategy needs to be looped back so that you know the decisions that we are making. The system is not always perfect, but over time it learns, right? So that's the beauty of the reinforcement learning. So again, we are not quite there in this stage, but this is where we are going towards. So with that, let me, let me close, and that's my uh, Twitter handle. More than happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you again. I, I guess there's probably going to be loads of questions about the, the comparison between the impact, but not now. So, um, Edward Gasser, you're the CEO of Chilek. He's going to talk about how gamification can help healthcare. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. I very, feel very privileged to be here uh, to talk about the subject that I love, obviously. Uh, can Super Mario become your personal doctor? Um, so the idea here is to see if we can leverage on the power of gaming in general to maybe help monitor patients that are affected by chronic diseases. Just to give you a bit of background on what I did and who I am. So I am French. I have a Parisian-based startup called Tilak, but before um, actually creating Tilak, I worked in the video, video game industry for 10 years at Gameloft, doing mobile video games. And on the side, I was also writing for TechCrunch, and uh, I've really basically been always um, enthusiastic about the fact that we can do some crossover between industries, and in that case, between um, healthcare and gaming. And Usually when I talk uh, to people about, you know, like video games and health, the first thing that comes to their mind is, yeah, but aren't gaming, isn't gaming bad for your health in general? It's true that the World Health Organization lately uh, classified gaming addiction as a disorder. So sometimes when I talk about my subjects, people are like, okay, what are you talking about? Uh, but actually, I think that what we need to uh, understand is that gaming has become inarguably the most important and interactive media of all. Right now, there are 2.6 billion people that are playing video games on a regular basis every day, um, um, of all over the world, sorry. And uh, just in the US, 67% of the American population is actually playing games on a regular basis. And what interested me when I was working in the video games is how can we leverage on this power of retention, this power of engagement, and this power of reach that video game has in order to solve to try to solve actually one of the biggest issues that current healthcare systems are facing. Um, because actually we can, we can do that, I'm gonna explain how. Um, we're gonna try to solve the issues of how can we manage more efficiently, effi efficiently sorry, patients that are affected by chronic diseases. Just to give you a bit of a context right now, um, in the US 75% of the healthcare cost are due to uh, the management of chronic diseases. And the problem is that it's kind of a time bomb in the sense that there is an ever-growing amount of patients, there is a shortage of specialists, and worst of all, there is non-compliance to treatment. And the thing is that if we don't rely on digital tools in order to solve that problem, then ultimately it's gonna be even worse in the future. The problem is that if you're trying to build a digital app today, is that after, th after only three days, you already lost 77% of your users, right? Um, and if you want to actually help doctors monitor their patients, you need to be able to have stickiness in order to follow them on a regular basis, follow the patient and actually retrieve clinical data on a regular, um, on a regular basis in order to adapt treatment. Now, retaining users is extremely hard. I just said 77% of your users are going to drop after three days. Uh, the good thing is that usually the top 10 apps, so the best apps are way overperforming that number. It means that if you build actually a good product, and especially with good prod value, then ultimately we bring retention. And retention and usage are the only way to get a meaningful set of data. So before we talk about mi big data, I had this discussion before with, uh, with, uh, with you, I think, Max. I think it's very important that we get actually a meaningful set of data, and then we can actually train, you know, like, uh, obviously the algorithm that they are building in order to, um, to uh, potentially predict uh, diseases. But before that, you need to actually collect the data. 
And the good thing is that mobile gaming, when it's properly done, is actually really good at retaining users. And more than retaining, it's really good at actually engage users. When I say engage, it means that people are coming back in the app very often. If you look at the percentage of retention after a month, you have several categories. Obviously, messaging is the first one because you're interacting almost every day with your family and your friends. But gaming is actually coming as second. And this is what we're going to use actually at TILAC, which is, uh, which, which is the startup I'm representing today. Um, we actually create fun, clinically validated medical mobile games to help monitor patients. So it's as simple as it sounds. It's a game that will be prescribed by the doctor that you download on your smartphone. You play at home, and it actually sends in real time clinical data about your disease. And according to the data that the doctor will receive, then he can more appropriately basically adapt your treatment. Um, so I'm going to try to give you an example with our first game. Um, we started with actually eye disease of aging. Um, which is not the easiest, to be honest, because we have a target population that is 65 plus. So our first challenge was to actually build a game that would match uh, this target population. But the thing is that, so eye disease of aging today are the leading cause of blindness in the, um, in the world. There are 217 million people that are affected, and unfortunately there is no way to actually heal the disease, but you can stop it. You can stop it with regular follow-up and what we call anti-VGF injections. So those are injections that you get in your eyes and basically stop the, the, it, it, it slows down the process of, um, of, of, evo of, of the evolution of the disease. However, the problem is that if you want to make sure that you treat at the right moment your patient, you need to be almost uh, you, you, the doctor needs to see them almost every day in order to see if their, uh, if, their, uh, if their vision has changed. Unfortunately, there are not enough ophthalmologists uh, in the world right now. In France, we have eight ophthalmologists for 100,000 inhabitants. In the UK, I think it's seven for 100,000 inhabitants. In the US, it's six. In China, it's one for 100,000 inhabitants, and in Rwanda, it's one for one million inhabitants. So basically, you're in a situation where you know that you could provide a better care, but because of the current situation, the current workflows, you can't. So we've decided to create the first clinically validated uh, mobile game to monitor vision remotely. It's been CMART, so it's really a medical device that has gone through regulation process and clinical trial. Uh, the idea here was to make sure that you had something that was compelling for the users, so interesting for them to play so that they could come back in it. So really a game that had the sim a similar prod value to what you can play when you're actually downloading a game on your smartphone, but also something that would be clinically relevant for the physician in order to actually um, make sure that they could analyze the data and, and adapt the treatment accordingly. So we went through regulatory process, we went through clinical, uh, through clinical uh, trial for, uh, with over 100 patients that are actually the idea was to make sure that the data that we were retrieving from the game would be equivalent to the data that you would get if you were going to the ophthalmologist. And fortunately, we, we proved that right. So right now, we've deployed in France uh, to over 40 ophthalmologists um, that have started implementing the game um, and actually prescribing the game. It's actually a bit weird to say that, but that's actually what's happening. Uh, so they are prescribing the game to a population that, ha that has on average 79, that is on average 79 year old. And the, the first thing that we wanted to prove over the past six months was to make sure that we had stickiness and usage. And you would be extremely surprised to see how much people are playing when they are 79. We have, after six months, we still have close to 50% of our users that are engaged every, second, every, uh, every two days. So instead of going to your doctor, when, when, when you have those diseases, usually you go see your ophthalmologist every 1.5 months, every two months. So that means that you get one data every 1.5 months in order to assess how the disease has evolved. But with other sites, since you get a data every two days, then ultimately you get 15 to 20 points of data. And so you're, uh, you understand better the disease and you can treat them at the right moment. And this is exactly what happened. So this is an example of an alert that has been received by a doctor. The, the, sorry, it's blue on blue, so it's going to be a bit complicated. But here is when he went to see the doctor. This is when actually he saw the second time the doctor. And he saw the second time the doctor because there was an alert on other side. And on other side, you could see that there was a change basically in the vision and then actually led to an injection. 
right now we've had uh, over the past six months 95 alerts that have been registered. So that means that for already 23 percent of our patients, we've optimized healthcare. So if you think about the number of patients that are affected by those diseases, you can clearly change the way people are, you know, like. Um, addressing management of chronic diseases. You can make the NHS save money. You can actually um, have a better life just because you know that you're monitored by your, by your doctor on a regular basis, and you can have fun with it. Um, so the good thing is that I think we can do that for many other diseases, and we've started, in our case, prototyping for psychiatry, and more specifically, we're working with, in collaboration with the Brigham and Women Children's Hospital in Boston on opioid addiction, a game that would actually prevent people from relapsing into their addiction. There's a lot of other uh, areas where we could work on. Unfortunately, we don't have the development bandwidth yet, but um, I just hope that, you know, like, People will consider gaming as just more than pure uh, as just more than pure entertainment, and actually use the media as it is as potentially the most powerful media that there is right now. Thank you so much. Ah, okay. Um, absolutely fascinating. How impressive is that? I had no anyway. Um, so ne next up is Jude Auer, who I've known for many many years who is a genuine pioneer, and she's using games to unleash the power of brands to do good. Feel free to clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name's Jude, and I'm the founder of a company called Playmob. And you know, much like Edward, um, using games as a, a way to be a powerful force for good. Um, but unlike some of the speakers, um, we haven't gone deep into a subject, we've gone quite broad. Um, and that's kind of our view of the world, is that we can reach 2.6 billion gamers, and I think we've got 2.5 in my presentation. So it's 2.6 billion gamers to make the world a better place. Um, so our big vision is to create a platform, which is essentially a global distribution platform for purpose-driven brands to reach gamers in order to nudge behavior um, and inspire, cha inspire change in the real world. Um, so how we're doing that is we're using gaming and data um, in order to build meaningful relationships between brands and players um, and to make an impact in the real world. Because, so I've been in gaming for about 15 years now. My background is in gaming for education and for training. Um, but what I find over the years is that you know, the perception of gaming is to build a game, it, it's costly, it takes time, and it takes a lot of people. Um, so we wanted to find a way that did this in a really succinct, quick, cost-effective way that, pr that produced results um, and helped to nudge behavior, but also to find a way that we can cut through the noise. So rather than building specific standalone games which take time, how can we use what's there already and build on that? Um, so the way that we work is, um, so when you're playing a game, there's an opportunity to have ad space, there's media space, which is typically video interstitials, um, and we use a format called a playable advert. And the reason that we use this is it's fun and it's engaging, it's within context. You're playing a game and you go to play another game. Um, so it's really good fun. It's typically being used right now to drive people to install another game or an app, and it's, it's effective at doing that. But we think there's a better way of using this. Because what's happening here is you're having a two-way conversation with the gamer. So you're reaching people, cutting through noise, and you're actually being able to have that conversation and gather up insights about what they care about. So we take this playable advert and we distribute it to games that reach the targeted audi audience, the, the people that we want to get the message to. And then within the game, we look at what actions that they take, and we can pose questions as well, so that we can find out more about what they care about, what they know about this, the topic, and, and what they would do um, what, would they, what they would do to affect change. And our view of the world as well, as, well as, as well is that brands have got an amazing opportunity. Brands, NGOs, and charities have got an amazing opportunity to make change in the world and to achieve the sustainable development goals. So everything that we do aligns to the SDGs as a framework so that we can see that the impact that we're making through games is making a true impact in the real world. Um, so we would cover all 17 SDGs. I think we've touched on about 13 or 14 so far. So we've got a few more to unlock. Um, so a few stats on gaming, which I think you probably already know, but I just thought it'd be useful to cover. And yeah, I put 2.4 billion, so this slide's probably about a year old. <laughs> it's 2.6 billion gamers now um, worldwide. So there's about 2.1, probably about 2.2 playing mobile games. 
So it's about a third of the global population. It's about 50% of the online population. Um, and by next year, it's set to be about 75% of the world's online population will be playing games. Because gaming in regions like um, Africa, Middle East, and India, South America are, are growing at such a phenomenal rate. Um, Mobile gaming, which is the area that we are specifically in, is ab ab about half of the industry, or, or it, it's more than console now um, for the first time ever. Um, so it's about a $70 billion market. Um, and it's grown at about, mobile gaming has grown, grown at about 25% year on year. Generally, gaming has grown about 8% year on year, um, and, but mobile is the fastest growth. But, but I think one of the interesting facts is if you look at how engagement compares to other types of media, so gaming and mobile gaming compared to if you're just on your phone or on your computer or watching TV, you're 98% engaged when you're playing. So you've got uninterrupted, pure attention. Um, you know, people are there and they're paying attention because um, they're not multi-screening. You, when you're playing a game, you have to be paying attention because if not, you'll be taken down by a zombie. You know, you have to be focused. Um, but typically, if you're watching TV or on your phone in general, you'll be using another screen. And I love this stat as well because this this shows that you know, gaming is the games industry is bigger than film and music combined, um, which is huge. Uh, yet, you know, it kind of sits in silo as a kind of misunderstood um, industry. So I wanted to share some examples about how we do what we do. Um, you know, we're, we're on a mission right now to really try and inspire behavior change. And we can do it in, in a certain amount within a playable advert. You've got about 30 to 60 seconds to really capture people's imaginations and to nudge behavior. But our goal is to then try and take that further, take it offline and really inspire behavior change in the real world. Um, so this is an example of uh, a campaign that we ran with UNOPS, which is the private arm of the UN. One of the challenges they had is how do we how do we educate people on sea levels rising? You know, when we all live on land, most of us, um, how do we educate people on what we could do to affect the sea levels rising? Because we think about that as a massive topic that you know is beyond our control. So we created a, it was a small 30 second long game. Um, you couldn't win it. So it's quite depressing. So you, you're, the, it was basically an island that you had to protect. You had to plant, plant mangroves and um, uh, build a wall to basically protect your island, to protect your community that lived on the island. Um, and here, what we were trying to do is, it was a short, snappy game that people can play and you know, quickly learn about the topic. And as the sea level was rising, you know, your time was running out, that you were under pressure to do something about it. And there was facts being thrown in, there was a few questions as well. Um, but the facts were things like, you know, um, sea, levels are are sea, sea levels rising because of global warming. Global warming is happening because of carbon emissions. And then it would give people a choice of what they can do to reduce their carbon emissions. So it tied this big topic down to what you can do on a daily basis. And we were, it, it, was, it was very simplified, um, but it, it was developed as a way to plant the seeds in order to inspire people to learn more about the topic and to take action in the real world. So we were giving people the choice of doing things like you know, unplug it or switch off your lights, eat less red meat or do car sharing, really simple things. And when we think about those things on a daily basis, they're really easy to do, but if you think about it at mass scale, we could start to really make a difference. Um, and from this, what was fascinating was some of the insights that we managed to gather. We had um, about 76, just over 76,000 people made pledges. So they made genuine pledges to make a difference. Um, we had about 54% engagement rate, which when you compare that to other types of media, um, was really, really high. And we believe it's because it was about, it was something meaningful for people. They were making a difference. Um, and this tiny little game, um, which only 30 seconds long, was about, in total, there was about 4.6 years of playtime. Um, so it was very simple, but it kind of opened up our eyes in terms of what more can we do um, to inspire behavior change. Um, this is one that we launched last year for um, World Ocean Day. So you might have heard of a game that's called Dumb Ways to Die, um, which was developed by the Melbourne Transport Authority as a way to educate people on not stepping on the tracks. It's a dumb way to die. So we uh, partnered with them and created Dumb Ways to Kill Oceans because we wanted people to understand about the actions that they take on a daily basis and how that's basically killing our oceans. Um, so again, same format. It was a simple game um, that, that was there to educate people on some of the topics like coral reef degradation, sea levels rising, and plastics in the ocean. Um, 
<clears throat> and it's still running now, so you can go to the website and, and still play the game and, and make your pledge and say what you care about. But what was really interesting was what you found out that most um, the majority of people cared about plastic pollution, um, but this was probably part of the Attenborough effect as well, because um, you know, big plastics was a big topic this last year and still is. Uh, but not very many people really kind of cared about coral reef degradation. So what that taught us was that there's more work that has to be done to educate people on why plant um, plant life in, sea, in the sea is, is vital. You know, every second breath that we take comes from the ocean, so we need to protect plants that are in our oceans. Um, so it was just interesting to see from the, some of the insights and data what people really cared about and then to encourage people to, um, to make a pledge. And this is a yearly campaign that we run with Pokemon Go. Um, so last year it started and we, we mobilized 5,000 people around the world to collect six tons of trash. What we did was through the game, we sent out a notice to players to, to, to see if they wanted to be part of the, essentially the world's biggest beach cleanup. Um, <clears throat> and everywhere from um, Taiwan to Hawaii, so it was a, a, across 24 hours, um, locations were set up where, where players could get together physically and actually do a beach cleanup. Um, so this was the results of last year in terms of um, it's about 5,000 people, so the results were slightly more. Um, and this was just a test, just to find out if players would actually get out into the real world and make a difference. Um, we did it again this year, and about 17,000 people turned up and cleared 145 tons of waste. So that's about the equivalent of about 24 elephants of waste in two weeks. Um, so it's grown about 20 times since last year. So what we're proving here is that gamers will get out into the real world and make a difference. Um, and this is just uh, this is the map of where all the locations are. Now, in terms of the number of people, if you think about how many people play Pokemon Go and how many people actually went to the beach cleanups, the only thing that limited us was the number of NGOs that were there to do the logistics on the ground. So the way that we worked this was um, an NGO could register a location, but it had a set amount of people. So it might only be able to take 100 people or 300 people. Um, so we were limited in terms of how big the spaces were. Um, but next year, we want to, to, again, improve the results, make this 10 times bigger, and keep on um, going for a 10x every year. And this year, we included not just beaches, but it was parks and rivers. Because last year, we had players come to us to say, you know, we live in land, but how can we take, how, how can we take part? Um, but this also showed as well that in Mexico, it was about 50% of the beach cleanups took part in, um, were in Mexico. Um, so this was one of the biggest problem areas uh, for cleanups. So I wanted to just quickly mention, you know, everything that we do aligns to the global goals. And what we found was that although there are about 214 games in the industry right now which are supporting the global goals, there was nothing to teach people about what the goals are. So we created um, a short mini game again, another playable advert, which was rolled out last year. Um, throughout September, uh, when the UN General Assembly was happening. And what this little game taught um, people was about what the goals are and how they could affect them. But it also allowed us to understand what people really cared about. Um, and what we understood was that people will, the, the, the most popular goal was hunger, yet more people would take action for poverty. So when we dug deeper into the data, this is what we started to uncover and really understood that poverty was based on the actions that people would take was the number one thing that they cared about. So we were starting to look at subliminal values and um, what people truly care about. Um, and this is just from the, from the games industry so far, how many games are supporting the goals in each of the different categories for the goals. So you can see the number one is um, good health and well-being. Um, and life on land was the second popular and then quality education. Um, so there's already a lot of work happening in the game space around the goals. So in terms of us, I mean, our, our big vision is that we want to mobilize a billion people to take action for the global goals and do it through gaming and do it in a way that's connecting shared values. So with organizations connecting with people based on what they care about and being able to educate people on, on what they don't know. People don't know what they don't know. So gaming gives us a great platform to reach people to help them understand about these big issues and how they could affect change. And ultimately, what we want to do is then inspire behavior change. On a very simplistic level, we're nudging behavior right now, but there's a much bigger part of what we do, which will be to take this further and look at long-term behavior change. Um, so the work that we're doing was 
inspired by um, researcher Jane McGonigal, who in 2010, she launched a book called Reality is Broken. Um, and what she said at the time was, we were spending about three billion hours per week playing games. And she said, if we get to 21 billion hours, we can start to solve some of the world's biggest problems, like cl climate change, poverty, and obesity. And if you look at gaming stats right now, we're, we're spending about 16 billion hours per week playing games. So we think there's a massive opportunity not only to reach people, but inspire change and look at what people truly care about and connect people based on those values. Um, so thank you for listening.